Hello, and welcome to Atlantic Debrief. My name is Johan Fleck. I'm the acting director of the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. And I'm excited today to be relaunching our social media format, Atlantic Debrief, an interview format dedicated to Europe and the Transatlantic Partnership. Every week, we want to bring you the perspectives of policymakers, newsmakers, and experts on the most critical issues facing the Transatlantic Partnership and Europe. I can think of few better things to start with than by discussing the 2022 Curb Up Policy Game, which we at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center were fortunate enough to partner with the Curba Foundation on. Um, and, and this year's theme for that annual policy game was what if Trump returns? Uh, a scenario-based efforts to assess policy options for Europe in the case of a significant shift in U.S. strategy, foreign policy, and domestic policy. And so I'm delighted to discuss some of the key takeaways from that policy game with two guests. First, Liana Fix, Program Director for International Affairs at the Körber Stiftung and our partner in this policy game and our own Damir Marusic, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. So warm welcome, Liana and Damir. Thanks. Thank you. Perhaps I can start with you, Liana, as a veteran of this policy game and the, the, the mastermind behind it. Um, and you can, you can give our audience the two minute version of what is the COBA policy game all about and what was the framing and the scenario as far as you can share for this year's edition of the policy game. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jan. Um, perhaps in a nutshell, what is the policy game about? The idea behind it is, is let's just design a scenario of a future development in transatlantic relations, which is perhaps not probable, but which is possible. And let's take a group of policymakers and experts from Europe. This time we had Germany, France, Poland and the UK with us and put them into the shoes of this scenario and try to create a situation of, let's say, a pressure cooker where they have to take decisions in a crisis situation in a very short period of time. And this year we chose to take the scenario, what if Trump returns as US president in 2024? And the idea behind, this was, behind it was, well, we have now this war in Europe, Russia's aggression against Ukraine. And we see that there's a lot of US leadership from the beginning of the war until now. Are Europeans actually prepared to take on responsibility for Ukraine if the United States after 2024 might shift its priorities? And the second question was, what if Europeans do not only have to take responsibility for Ukraine security, increasing military supplies, upholding sanctions if the United States withdraws, but also what if Europeans have to take care for their own security if we see that the United States disengages from Europe, perhaps proposes bilateral security guarantees in a transactional way um, in return for, um, for concessions on China from Europe, so what if um, the United States um, withdraws from Europe and the last twist that we discussed at the policy game is the worst case scenario. What if Russia would use such a scenario to um, attack Europe and to attack NATO territory? We chose the Svalbard Islands for this exercise. Thank you, Liana, for that overview. Pressure cooker is I think is 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 the the word that stands out here uh Damir you were you participated on on the Atlantic Council's behalf uh with with actual policymakers in in the room from those four countries that Liana mentioned Germany France Poland and the UK you were able to jump from team to team and see the debriefings as well um what were the biggest takeaways for you seeing this for the first time and this specific scenario and perhaps the biggest surprises you saw? I, I think uh, for me, the um, I, I, I wasn't surprised so much to see uh, the how the scenarios played out um, given 
you know, uh, the kind of policies that the Trump administration would play uh, against Europe and against European actors themselves. Um, I, I think that the scenarios were, were built very well for that, and, and we saw a kind of chaos enter the decision-making process uh, among the Europeans. But what I, I found really jumped out at me is that as the scenarios got worse and worse, and as we, we got to the, uh, uh, what, what Liana was saying, the, the invasion of Svalbard, um, you actually had a kind of uh, European cohesion coming together uh, in, that, in that scenario, which uh, um, actually tells us something useful, I think, about, about where Europe is and, and uh, in its evolution, in its uh, growing together into becoming um, a true geopolitical actor. Um, it's still vulnerable. I think uh, the United States is still uh, an incredibly um, important actor uh, in basically not just European uh, stability and security, but in, in European cohesion. Uh, but I think that, that, that uh, as forcing events, and you know, an, another Trump administration certainly would be a forcing event, but as they escalate, um, you, you will see, you might see, uh, given the, the results of, of, uh, of the policy game, a certain kind of knitting together uh, of, of Europe uh, in, in the face of adversity. And, and similar question, thank you, Dami. A similar question for you, Liana. Um, obviously, uh, what if Trump returns is is there to capture uh, people's attention and and you know play to to policymakers' experiences uh, and and really sort of drive uh, to some results. But what were some of the broader takeaways as and, and especially as someone uh, like you who's done a number of these policy games over the years. Um, what, what was special about this one? Um, Trump influence or not, what were the biggest takeaways for you? I think from my perspective, it was actually the most emotional policy game that I've ever attended and that I've conducted. And I think the reason behind that is that the war in Ukraine and the war against Ukraine brought out the most existential fears of Europeans. So for the Polish team, it was existential how Europeans would react to a US withdrawal from Ukraine. Would they continue to support Ukraine or would they sort of um, say, well, there's nothing we can do without the United States. We are not able to uphold our support for Ukraine. And we see how the disagreements that we've seen throughout the war, despite the overall unity, have played out in this scenario. And that is why we were very happy that we ended on a positive note. <laughs> but on the way to this positive note, there was quite a lot of disagreement. And there was especially a lot of disagreement on the question, can Europeans trust each other with their own security? And what if the United States comes in and tries to divide Europeans with, you know, offers of bilateral security guarantees? And one additional aspect which I found surprising was that the, um, the assessment of the first Trump presidency was very different among Europeans, but Europeans assumed that everyone perceived it in the same way. So for Germany and France, it was the end of the West. It would be the end of the West. For the Polish team, it was, well, hopefully they will just continue traditional Republican foreign policy priorities in line with our interests. And the UK would want to be a bridge and global Britain as always. But I think this is something that the Europeans have not yet analyzed, how they look at Trump's first presidency and what this would mean for a potential another Trump presidency. I was I was struck by one takeaway in the report I should highlight that that we did together Europe home alone what if Trump returns and that's on our website uh, on our websites um, one takeaway that that struck me was um, has little to do with any specific president um, but is is the central role of the United States in supporting Ukraine and maintaining major support to allow Ukraine to continue uh, its fight against Russia's aggress aggression. Uh, based on that policy game, what can we learn about how bad could it get for Ukraine and by extension Europe um, if U.S. support, if the United States got distracted and your U.S. support were to uh, decrease or, or even melt away? I mean, uh, 
Leon, I, I wonder, you know, I, I, I imagine you don't disagree too much, but it, it really is, it's, it's in, the, in the immediate term, uh, there is no game without the United States uh, pulling its weight. I mean, that, that kept coming up over and over again was, wow, like, you know, we, we can't actually do much for Ukraine. Again, I think you're, it's, it's, it varied by country by country where they, where they sat is where they stood. But it's, um, uh, but it is striking the extent to which uh, the the Europeans are in fact uh, still the the outsized role that the United States plays. I mean, it's it's almost a commonplace, I think, among among uh, some of us that, that that watch this stuff. We 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 nod in assent, yes, yes, yes. But it was really striking to see it. I think uh, uh, in play that right there. Um, so I and I. I don't think that there's any easy solution in the, in the immediate term for this, is that, that in fact I think it's something that needs to be uh, internalized, that, that uh, Ukraine's uh, future relies on the United States holding the line. Obviously European partners are critical on this and it cannot be alone, uh, but if, if uh, that sizable brick goes away, the, the wall starts crumbling in a big way, I think. I think I would completely agree. I mean, the United States is the indispensable nation at this war. It depends on the U.S. contribution if Russia wins or loses. And this will continue. But what I find is the most important takeaway for today and for today's situation is that looking into this potential future 2024, Europeans should start now, think about whether their contribution to the war in Ukraine is enough and whether it's enough to lean in um, to this United States leadership world or whether they shouldn't be now have developed contingency plans and increase their support for Ukraine, knowing well that the United States is on a, a potentially difficult path in the next years. That leads me to, to another question. Uh, you already spoke about some of uh, the dynamics between the European countries, and you just you just mentioned what can Europe do now to prepare for um, a, a much more challenging role and and a role perhaps without much U.S. support in a scenario like that, but certainly in a in a much more uncertain geopolitical context. What lessons do you think? What takeaways did you see? Uh, Liana and then then Damir in that um, in 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 the policy game and the dynamics you saw. Yeah, we proposed a policy recommendation to work stronger within the format of the Weimar Triangle, and I know that everyone is you know in principle agrees that the Weimar Triangle, which means France, Germany, and Poland, is great. But unfortunately, there's not a lot going on in this context. Um, but we thought it's still important to put this into the report because what we saw in the policy game is that despite the unity of Europe's response to the war, there are these disagreements. For Poland and the Baltic states, this war is existential. It's about the most fundamental fears that they have. For Germany and France, this war is um, problematic. It's a bigger threat to European security, but it is not as existential as it is for its neighbors. And I think to acknowledge that there is a difference in the perception and to do more to make Europeans look, and especially Central and Eastern Europeans, look back at 2022 and say, okay, judging by France's and Germany's performance, we can actually trust each other. That would be the best takeaway um, and the best lesson learned from this year. And I think we're not there yet. So converging perspectives and, and building up trust. Uh, Damir, any, any thoughts on sort of what can Europe do right now? Look, I, 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 let me just answer it slightly differently rather than, than uh, you know, a, a policy prescription, just reflecting on what, what Liana just said. Um, somehow, I, you know, I guess my hope for the, 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 the policy game result would be that um, the reality of the dependence uh, would come together with the reality of what this war means for Europe despite the divergences that I think emerge in the policy game, you know, regionally, um, to basically focus minds. And whether it's the Weimar Triangle, whatever format it is, but that, that the conversation gets going. The conversation gets going about the vulnerability of Europe and its dependence on the United States. 
in many ways, you know, it's it's. Uh, I, 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 I rue by the day more and more uh, President Biden's remarks that America's back uh, in a lot of ways. I think I think it's it was necessary for a lot of Europeans to hear that. Uh, but in a lot of ways, it's it's the wrong message uh, because uh, it it's we're back to the old kind of um, sense of complacency. Uh, what I really uh, appreciated about the the policy game is that um, you know being a participant, watching it up close, it really did rattle people. It was a very emotional one, as as Liana said. Um, I would I would hope that 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 emotion somehow filters out and 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 catalyzes more conversations. Because that's that's what's where this needs to start. What the actual format is, where these discussions happen, and uh, uh, the next steps taken, uh, those are implementation details of the bigger of the bigger question. I think. Any reactions, Liana, to that, or any other recommendations you want to highlight? I think one additional one, and I'm. Uh... I think it's an interesting one because we actually predicted correctly in our scenario in the policy game that Liz Truss would be the next Prime Minister of the UK, which lent some credibility to our thinking there. But the point that I want to make about the UK, which I thought was interesting because we often talk about the EU if we talk about Europeans, and we also saw this dynamic in the policy game that EU Europeans often forgot about the UK, whereas the UK, interestingly, try to play quite a leadership role. And I think this is another interesting takeaway that you know we have to look at Europe in a comprehensive way and to think about what role the UK can play. Um, we see that they take a leadership role now in the Ukraine war, but they are willing to do more. Um, so bringing the EU and the UK closer together on European security issues, I think is uh, one of the most important the tasks of the next years. Well, thank you so much, Liana and Damir. Uh, some great takeaways. I can only recommend everyone check out the Europe Home Alone What If Trump's Trump Returns uh, report that captures some of those key takeaways and recommendations from the COBA Policy Game 2022. We were delighted to partner with you, Liana, your team, and the COBA Foundation, obviously. And at the Atlantic Council Europe Center, we will be continuing what Damir said, that conversation, that conversation has to start. Uh, and we will continue a, with Atlantic Debrief to, to assess uh, a lot of these developments. So stay tuned. Thank you, Liana and Damir for joining us and everyone check out the report. Thank you so much and see you soon on, on Atlantic Debrief. Thank you. Thanks.